The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you here. For our announcements this morning, we greet you in the name of Jesus Christ as we come for our worship this morning. We ask if you are not with us in person but are online, that you comment, that you like, that you let us know that you're there, and, uh, and hit share and let uh, many other people be able to see where we are and, uh, and that we are here. Uh, I was asked if I would give a uh, brief word as well about the grab-and-go meals. The deadline is the 23rd, and we don't have as many uh, as we thought we were going to receive. Uh, so if, if you've been putting that off or thinking about it, uh, go ahead and make that call uh, here to the office uh, and let us know that you want that meal for uh, the end of the month. We are working as well. Uh, we've been having some conversations about our autumn kickoff. Normally we have a lot of activities that start up in the fall and, and we can't say where we'll be, but that doesn't mean that we can't do things uh, online, that we can't be engaged in groups, that we can't connect with each other, maybe a little bit more distantly, but we're thinking about uh, a course or a class or a Zoom meeting or whatever that would be. But as well, let us know if you have an interest for something that you'd like that to be as we're thinking about the shape of that over the next month, month and a half, and bringing that uh, to completion. Also be watching us on Facebook for our posts on Wednesdays, 12.15, noon-ish, for uh, Brian, for the recitals, and as well for my devotional moments at 2 p.m. Please uh, note and pray this morning for those that you see on the prayer list in your bulletin, and call the office and let us know if you have a request for prayer, if you have uh, a need or a joy that you would like to share with the rest of the body. Lift up your hearts. Let us worship God as we open with choral praise.
call to worship. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the, through the Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit who has been given us. Please join me in the opening prayer. Let us pray. Living God, you have placed in the hearts of your children a longing for your word and a hunger for your truth. Grant that, believing in the one whom you have sent, we may know him to be the true bread of heaven, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early the next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed upon his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on top of it. He called that place Bethel. The second reading today is from Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 16. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves, so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. This is the time usually that we give to talk to the children, usually saying something about the messages that we've just heard from the Bible, about Jacob who heard a, a word from God, and suddenly realized he was in God's presence that he hadn't realized before. And as well, from the book of Romans, about how God's spirit speaks to our spirit in ways that, it, that are meant to comfort us, we aren't always paying attention, but every now and again, the message gets through. I thought about that and what it's like to not be paying attention and you know what? There is an instrument in all of our houses that keeps us from paying attention. And this is it. It's called a TV remote. And we sit there and we watch our favorite shows. And if there's some noise in the background, we turn up the volume. Maybe that noise in the background is uh, our mom or our dad trying to get our attention. And this device causes us not to be able to hear what's going on. And it causes, it causes a situation that looks like this. <laughs> In one ear and out the other. This particular one is the left-hand version. And, and, and this is the right-hand version. But they do roughly the same thing as we're sitting there and we give half of a response. Do you know what half of a response is? I want you to go and unload the dishwasher. Yeah, okay, okay. I want you to go pick up your room. Yeah, Mom, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll get to you. Keep turning up the volume, and it doesn't seem to do anything because the need is still there. Empty the dishwasher. And if we, you know, back in, when I was your age, we didn't have these that you can actually push pause. You can pause, push pause, and then you take this off, and you set this down, and you turn and you face mom or dad and you say yes, and then you're not just hearing, you're listening. It will, if we learn to be able to do that, to practice that, it means that in our relationships with our friends, it'll help. It means that when we're in the classroom and need to be listening to the teacher, that we're able not just to hear things that they say and it kind of goes aside, we listen. 
And Paul is telling the church at Rome to listen as well to the nudging of the Spirit. We'll call it the Holy Spirit. We'll call it the angel of our better nature. We'll call it our conscience. But we're listening. We're listening so that we can do what God wants us to do and grow and become the people God wants us to be. And all of our friendships and relationships will be better when we really take the time to hear what they're saying. Let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks for the friends we have and the family we know and those who, who teach us and those who help us to learn and to grow and to become. Most of all, Lord, help us to hear what we need to hear. Help us to listen when we need for the important things that are being said. All this we give you thanks for in Jesus' name. Our next hymn, number 144, This Is My Father's World. <laughs> Faithful will find God around every corner. And sometimes, even those who have not been faithful can be surprised by joy in a moment. We're told that Genesis is a book about promise. Promises that God has made to Abram, to Isaac, and now here we see to Jacob. Promise that leads to life, to hope, to blessing for all the world. And the promise as well that meetings such as the one we read about today occur. That God is there when we least expect, when we most hope, when we most fervently wish, when we most deeply need that God is there. Jacob has a dream. He, he is on his way north. Last week we, we heard uh, about how he got his brother to give him the birthright for a bowl of stew. 
What has happened in the interim is that the father was to offer in his last days a blessing uh, upon his sons. And he intended to give the, the good blessing to his elder son Esau and Jacob and Jacob's mother, Rebecca, saw to it that Jacob was the recipient of that. And Esau is fit to be tied, breathing out threats. Jacob is sent north to the family from where Rebekah had come, Laban. He, he is fearful for his life. He is halfway there. He is at this place that Abraham had been at himself. We read about in chapter 12 and we read about in chapter 13 that there were times that Abraham himself was at Bethel. Jacob finds himself there, spending the night. He has a, a rock for a pillow, perhaps looking up at the stars in the sky and wondering where the heck he's going and what his life will hold for him. And he has a dream. God speaks to him in this dream, and he sees this ladder, this stairway, this ramp, however it is, it is comprised, but messengers and angels and beings going up and down upon this from the heavenly to the earthly realms and back again. And in the midst of the dream, it is all God's initiative to say to Jacob, you are the one for whom the promise shall be, in whom the promise shall reside. Your destiny is determined, is hopeful. The promise is revisited again, first as it was with Abraham, then as it was with Isaac, and now with Jacob. He awakes and he senses that, that this is a sacred space that he was completely unaware of when he lay down that night in fear and in uncertainty. And the fear and the uncertainty are gone. Afterward, it is Jacob's initiative that will shape the future. As we think about visions and as we read through the scriptures and we see various places where other people had visions of God, that, that others were granted a dream to enable them to understand something, it can seem a very subjective thing. We go through this ourselves when we wake in the morning and we have, have had some dream. I was telling Doreen if, uh, a week or so ago that I'd had this odd dream just before I woke up. I was making people grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup. They, all, they always have to go together, right? Grilled cheese and tomato soup. And, but there was only like one or two people. And I was looking for a can of tomato soup. And I knew that for some reason I knew in the dream that I was required to drink all the rest of the tomato soup after everybody else had had theirs. And the only can of tomato soup I could find was like a two-gallon can of tomato soup. And I was worried because I thought, I cannot drink two gallons of tomato soup. And I thought, I woke up and I thought, what in the world does that mean? You know, for Jacob, the dream is about his future. It's not just his anxieties working themselves out in the night. It's understood that this is a, an instrument, this dream that God has used to reach out to Jacob. That this is a real presence of God. Not like me and my tomato soup. I think that might have to do with the fact that we've entertained people in the past and now we have so few people who come anymore to share our table, if anyone at all. 
very personal this was for Jacob. It spoke to the heart of his need at that point. John Wesley was at a meeting in Aldersgate Street when he too had a perception, not necessarily a vision or a dream, but undeniable in its power and its effect. They were in someone's house having a Bible study and it was on the book of Romans. And they were studying a book that Martin Luther had written about Romans and they were just reading through the preface. They hadn't even gotten to the meat of the passages and John Wesley wrote in his journal that he said, at that moment, I felt my heart strangely warmed. And I felt not only that, that Jesus had died for sins, but that Jesus had died for my sin. And this wave of emotion came over him. And this perception, this assurance that he felt that faith was real, and that he had no fear left in him. That question that people would ask, if you were to die tonight, do you know where you would be? At that moment, John Wesley would be able to say, yes, I do indeed know where I would be. I would be with Jesus. Now, with the kids, we, we were talking about learning to listen. Learning to listen more than just to hear words go past our ears but to listen and that dream or that vision or that feeling or that strangely warmed heart are all part of those kinds of listening the kind of listening that jesus said about the shepherd that the sheep know his voice and they'll not follow a stranger but they'll listen for the voice of the shepherd because it's the shepherd who offers them life and hope. When I was in Bible college, we had a special event that took place, a spiritual life enrichment two or three day period where they canceled all the classes and everybody rejoiced. And then they said, you have to go to the chapel all day long. And everyone said, oh, but it was, it was great. I remember it still. There was a speaker who came and who talked with us and then we had breakout sessions where we prayed together and we talked about our lives and then we came back and had another session. And, and he had up on the stage three chairs and it's significant for us as we go through the book of Genesis because the first chair was Abraham's chair and the second was Isaac's chair and the third was Jacob's chair and he said you're all sitting in one of these three chairs the Abraham chair represents those who are completely and utterly and totally given to God they've heard the message of faith they they since you know God speaking to them they whether whether through a dream or whatever way they know who they are and whose they are they're wholly given over to God and he said the way that Isaac is portrayed in scripture, there's very little written about him. He's, he has a reverence for God. But the scriptures don't speak about him having this sold out kind of faith for God. And maybe that's just where he is in his life and what was asked of him. And then you get to Jacob. You go from totally sold out to God, to revering God, to saying, God, who? Until this moment, in this night, fleeing to his uncle Laban somewhere north, and God shakes him to wake him with a dream that will guide his destiny for the rest of his life days. Jacob, who will be God's instrument. And yet there is a cost. There are consequences for the choices he has made and the way this has happened and, and in a way things he can't control about who his brother is and the anger he feels that he must flee. 
He is blessed and sent off by his father. He is, he is, I'm sure, kissed and embraced by his mother. He will never see them again. In the next 21 years, he will be further north with the extended family. And by the time he comes back, his parents are, are gone. There's the cost of going in the direction that he has but it's God's direction for the rest of his life. And despite this cost, this is the journey that he chooses. I am fully assured in my own life and the choices I have made and the doors that have been opened and, and with doors being opened, the doors have, that have been closed, I, I am fully assured in my life that there is no better place to be than in the center of God's will for my life. As we started, so we finish. God is around every corner for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. And all the faithful said, Amen. Let us pray. Sovereign God, we praise you today for your great goodness, your love which has redeemed us in Christ, which has welcomed us as your people, and which watches over us throughout eternity. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. We have no claim on your goodness, no right for your love, for day after day we fail you, it's still you rejoice in our praises and value the service we offer. Restore the love we have first. Despite our disobedience, we know that you are always with us, inviting us to receive your forgiveness and to start again. Your patience never exhausted, your call never withdrawn. Praise your mercies, new how often we get in the way of all your efforts to bless us or stand in the way of your blessings for others. Yet in a moment, in a flash of inspiration, we recognize your love. We grasp how deep is your love for us. May, May our, our eyes recognize your faithfulness. We rededicate our lives to your service. Take what we are in all our weakness and use us to your glory. Grant to us an abiding vision to carry us throughout all our days. As Jesus taught his disciples, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this Give us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It is now time for our offering. I remind those of you who are here with us in the sanctuary that there is an offering plate. Uh, at the back of the sanctuary for us to use as a retiring offering as we are departing the service. But my thanks as well to those of you who are online who continue to make your e-giving, who continue to offer both your gifts, your service, your witness, your prayers, your presence for the support of your congregation and the church around the world.
Lord God, we give you thanks for every blessing that we have received for your hand. We ask your blessing go forth upon all the gifts that are given, and all the service that is offered, all the time and talent of your people. All these things we ask you to bless and send forth that your name may be glorified. All this we praise you for in Jesus' name. In our moment for mission, uh, we have a special guest who has also been our reader for this morning. Uh, Kara Mason is going to come and say a few things about her work with the Coriopolis Community Development.
return now to the world, for Christ is there, waiting to meet you and greet you. Go back with eyes open to see him, ears open to hear him, and a heart open to serve him for his namesake.